forward. Um, so in the last class, we basically talked about uh, in evidences of, we talked about evidences of evolution where we started with comparative anatomy and morphology. And we talked about how analogous and homologous organs have evolved and homologous organs provide us the evidence for divergent evolution in play. They are, they are a result of divergent evolution themselves. And what does it mean? It means that when organisms having similar kind of structure, anatomy, and which, which they inherited from common ancestors, when they adapt to live and survive and proliferate in very different habitats, using the same anatomy, they can achieve different functions um, <clears throat> in their respective habitats, right? And in that we talked about uh, the four limbs of like human and other mammals like cheetah, aquatic mammals, which is whale and aerial uh, flying mammals like bat. But we know that since all are mammals and all have evolved and diverged from a common ancestors uh, long back in time, so we can see that the evidence are there in their anatomy, but using the same anatomy, they can now achieve different functions, right? An opposite of it is convergent evolution, where if we talk about the, the wings of a bird as compared to a butterfly and a bat, all of these structures help them to fly, right? Because all of them have adapted to fly, but the anatomical structure uh, is very different. Like the wings of a butterfly and a, and a bat and a bird are all very, very different structures. So the, you, there, there you will not see a common like conservation or conserved anatomy or common ancestry, right? And after that, we also talked about uh, examples in, in plants uh, for that matter. Plants also have these examples and evidences that tells about both convergent and divergent evolution. Is, is that part clear to you? Yes, good? Yeah. Then we went on to talk about um, uh, uh, further more evidences of natural selection that we talked about. Before that, we also talked about um, artificial selection and artificial breeding, which humans have been doing from a long time now in, in, in dogs, cats, which, and as animals and also in plants, with many plants we have we have done that. And just to understand the same thing in nature, we talked about a study that was done in in England over a span of around seventy years, um, which talks about evidences of industrial melanization, and it supports evolution by natural selection as right this whole process. And what happened in this study was that around the mid 19th century in the 1850, a collection of moths was made. And this time was pre-industrial uh, era. And there were more white moths, white winged moths, and which, which, we, which you can also say biologically as non-melanized moths. And in a span of just 70 years, what changed drastically in England was the industrial revolution happened and there were lots and lots of industries around many prominent cities, big cities. And when again in 1920, a collection of moth samples were done from the same areas, they realized that now the population has shifted towards dark wing, dark wing winged moths more, which are melanized moths and not, and, and the white wing moths, which used to dominate are now in minority. And why this happened? Because due to industrial industrialization, Two things happened. One, pollution increased. So the barks, which had this white colored or light colored lichen growing on it, they died because lichens cannot survive in, in polluted environments. The second thing that happened was the soot or the, or, the, or, the, or the smoke from these industries because back in, in the 19th century, all these were heavily coal driven, coal powered in, uh, factories. So the smoke 
also made these barks a little darker in shade and dark wing moths then got selected for predation and they were not predated as they, they could camouflage and evade predation but wide wing moths were uh, vulnerable to predation <laughs> vulnerable to predation in a darker background so this led to the selection naturally the driving force changed and because of this driving force or the driving pressure being changed the selection of one kind of trait over the other was favored so this tells us a direct evidence of natural selection is this part also clear to you yeah okay good yeah great and then we came to adaptive radiation we talked about how what darwin uh, studied on the islands of galapagos and we have rabia also joining in good evening rabia how are you good evening sir i'm good how are you yeah i'm i'm better um recovering from so throat but it's fine it's just the weather nothing much yeah so uh, uh, i was saying we were discussing what we have done till now to come to the same page and then we can pick from there do you have any questions rabia from the last class anything you want to ask no sir yeah okay so th then we talked about adaptive radiation uh, we 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 talked about darwin finches and how darwin could figure out very brilliantly that all these finches must have uh, evolved from a common seed eating ancestral population and these the changes in their size and the beak structure basically beak size and beak shape was because of different food available to them on different islands in that cluster so based on which island that bird is you will find if that island has uh, is more insects available as food for these finches then more insectivorous will be present there and less of seed eating or fruit eating if the island is more green with lots of fruit uh, bearing trees then you will see more frugivorous or vegetarian finches and not much of um, insectivorous finches and so on so this tells us basically that again from a common population uh, based on adaptations the same species can radiate out in all directions of evolution and can new species can be formed from the pre existing species with changes in their in their structure and now here how it is different from divergent evolution is because in divergent evolution these are already very very different organisms like one is cheetah one is human one is a bat and one is a whale so th those are very very different organisms who at one point of time back in evolutionary history had a common ancestor but what's happening in adaptive radiation is that these are the very closely related organisms of the of the similar species of the same genus many a times that adapt in a very short time as compared to divergent evolution and then make different species is that clear to both of you parker and and rabia yes sir yeah. any doubts till now no sir no oh, okay so and, and then i ask you to go back and read about the marsupials adaptive radiation um uh, where <clears throat> marsupials are placental marsupials versus placental mammals um evolution also is given in your textbook so did you go back and read about adaptive radiation of marsupials no. yes no no you couldn't okay uh, no worries so let's let's uh, spend some time there to begin with in today's class yeah <clears throat> so just like darwin finches there is adaptive radiation of marsupials now when we talk about marsupials it simply means that the, the babies are born premature okay so 
young ones are born without complete development okay and then once they are born then they are kept in pouches so these marsupial mammals have pouch which is a distinct distinguishing feature from um, placental mammals uh, so in placental mammals babies are born when they are completely developed and they just need to grow they still keep developing to an extent but like most of the development is done and then it uh, it, it is born but in marsupials that's not the case so in in marsupial radiation which happened in australia from a common point you will see a lot of different marsupial mammals right and all these are related because they are all like marsupial but they are very they have they have evolved because of uh, because of different um, Shape. They have evolved in different shapes and sizes. Like starting with organisms like you know kangaroo, right? And this is the most common thing to begin with. You know kangaroo. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. And then there is something called uh, like a koala bear. Right? Koala bear are, are the bears which are which are the <clears throat> um, what, what do you say? Sorry. Come again. They are mostly called bears. Yeah. I, no. Yes. But I was saying that koala bears are the bears which are the inspirations for teddy bears mostly for that that kids have. We often think that that's the normal bear, but that's that's the koala bear. If you if you look carefully, Iram has also joined in. Good evening, Iram. Evening, sir. So we are discussing about adaptive radiation in marsupials, uh, which I gave all of you as homework. Did you go back and read about it, Iram? Are you there? No. Uh, yes, sir. So no, okay. sir. I actually had exams. Uh, I see. Okay. No worries. So we are just talking about some. Um, we are talking about it now. So kangaroos, koalas, or we also have. A uh, wombat. If you know these organisms, I think some of them are also pictured in NCRT. So just just look at the diagram and you will understand. We have flying phalangers, which are like flying squirrels. We call it flying phalangers, or it's also known as the the glider. The sugar glider is another name. And then there is the mole, which is the marsupial mole. and there is a non marsupial mole which is a placental mole which is called the called known as the common mole so all these organisms or there is ant eater there are which feed on eat uh, which feed on ants so there are ant eaters and there are then then these uh, numbats which are called banded ant eaters right so these are marsupials they have their counterparts which are placental so basically uh, this is called marsupial radiation okay and how do we how do we define this is right you can just write down the process write down what is adaptive radiation in general and the process in evolution the process in evolution of of different of different species different species forming in a given geographical area different species forming in a given geographical area Sp 
starting from a common point of origin starting from a common starting from the common point of origin and radiating to other geographical areas and radiating radiating means you know going out to other geographical areas is called adaptive radiation okay is, is that clear everyone all of you understand that are you there people yes sir okay perfect now just think about it now all these processes it's not like one is happening and the other is not happening because all these are like adaptive radiation um uh divergent evolution convergent evolution these are all terms and names that we have given when we study each process in isolation but in nature it's not like in one area only this is happening and the other is not happening right in nature all of them might be happening simultaneously at the at the same place so if you think about adaptive radiation let's say there are adaptive radiations happening in multiple places with multiple organisms then if we if we think it in a way if multiple adaptive radiations are happening then it will lead to convergent evolution or divergent evolution what do you think let's say in one in one particular region uh, australia is a very good example to study this let's say in australia we know that adaptive radiations of marsupials happened right if more than one adaptive radiation happens in in an isolated area which is which is let's say australia it's very isolated okay uh, but in that isolated area there are different sub habitats right australia has coastal areas australia also has a uh, arid desert kind of area australia also has forests and beaches and all so australia as a whole is isolated but in it, in itself if there are more than one adaptive radiations happening do you think it will be like a convergent evolution in these specific places yes no let's say this is isolated land okay isolated geographical area now this region is coast this is uh, let's say forest and this is the desert okay let's go to the coast let's say this is a desert right so there are different areas in the same isolated geographical area now one adaptive radiation happened okay and because of that you see different kind of organisms going from one place to another right and then another adaptive radiation happened in another another set of organisms some because of which some went here so if i look at and then the third one also happened let's say let's take three so three adaptive radiations one went here one went here right 
Now, this is A, this is B, this is C. But if I look at this region, then I have one, two, three organisms as a result of three different adaptive radiations. But all three of them will now adapt to live in a desert. Make sense to you? So group of organisms from group A during adaptive radiation, one came to desert and started, let's say it was a bird, okay? Let's say B was a reptile and C was a mammal. So a bird, a reptile and mammal independently in that same geographical area showed adaptive radiations, but because of which one of each ended up in desert, one of each ended up in forest, one of each ended up in a beach or a aquatic area. So now do you think that because <clears throat> one representative from each ended up in a desert because of ra adaptive radiation, now in the those who are in the desert, there'll be a convergent evolution also happening in these because whatever you are, if you're living in a desert, you have to have some common adaptations that help you survive in a desert, correct? Does it make sense to all of you? And, and what yes, could be sir. that one? And what could be that one thing if it's a desert? Then you have that you have to tolerate low water and then your mechanism your, your bodily mechanisms will be like to conserve water and be able to live on very low amount of water and be able to store water in your body, right? Not waste it. So you will, all the desert animals, they don't pee much because if they will keep peeing, they will keep losing water. So whether it's a desert rat or a kangaroo in a different part of the world or something living in Sahara like a camel. So you won't see that those who are in desert, they are just peeing very often and peeing a lot because they won't like to lose water. Instead, all of these organisms have evolved mechanisms which are similar to conserve water, okay? Similar in, in, in one or the other way. For example, camel stores water majorly in the body, in a hump-like area. Other organisms which are smaller also store water and do not defecate it. They will not sweat a lot, right? So they will not use sweating as a mechanism to control their body temperature a lot. They will be able to tolerate higher temperatures. They will not come out and forage and you know um, wander around during the day when the temperature is very high. So most of the animals will either come during the dusk or the dawn, or if they are nocturnal during the night, that protects them from direct heat. So all these adaptations, whether they are behavioral, physical, <clears throat> physiological, it will be common in multiple different organisms, right? So don't you think that that becomes a convergent evolution then? That different organisms having different structures and body anatomy have similar kind of functions um, and similar kind of adaptations. Make sense to all of you? Yes, sir. yes. But how did these three organisms ended up in desert because of adaptive radiation in the first place? Different, more than one adaptive radiation. Does that make sense also? Yes. Yeah. So you can, you know, if you have a question. Yeah, Parker says, so then how do camels survive? So Parker, do you, uh, are you asking how do camels survive without uh, having access to water or what? Yeah, that's before. Oh, I already, okay, your, your, your question was before that. Okay, I understood. So camels uh, have a lot of adaptations to survive in desert including padded foot because of which camels can walk very fast on desert. But if a human or any other organism tries to walk like a, a cheetah or a reindeer or a, anyone will not be able to walk because our feet will you know, get inside the sand. But camels because of padded feet can push the sand back and you know keep walking on it. Um, 
and then they have humps in which they store water they don't sweat a lot they don't waste water in urine uh, they don't dilute their um, wastes a lot plus to store water in their blood also they have their rbc is different shaped so the rbcs of camel are not though they are mammals all other mammals have rbcs which are biconcave shape which is like a shape like this shape like balushahi if you look from the side this area will be thicker and this area will be thinner so from the side it will look something like this and from the front it will look like this so this is how normal rbcs are but in camel the rbcs are like this it's like pointed at the end it's like a rugby ball so this shape helps the rbcs tolerate a lot of water in the blood otherwise rbcs can swell up and burst so in in humans if you drink more than required water if you drink too much of water if there is too much water in your blood that is also harmful in fact that can cause a lot of problem okay so we have to drink water but we have to drink within a limit and more than a threshold camels can drink in one go as much as around 100 liters of water now 100 liter of water if they drink in one go that's an ad adaptation where do they keep all this water without urinating they keep it in the blood the blood volume becomes more and it blood becomes very thin and they keep it in their hump stored so all these are adaptations that's how camels can survive and a buffalo or a cow or a goat or another mammal cannot survive that much in the in the desert make sense to you parker does that answer your question yes so yes yeah. uh so uh, let's say an organism is migrated or transferred to a deserted region mm -hmm. and um, firstly it will take time for the organism to adapt into a different you know environment so won't that uh, before adapting only won't that be vulnerable because uh, it's a complete different uh, environment and it takes time for you to adapt there no so exactly. aren't there yes yeah. isn't there yeah. chances yeah. for the organism to die before adapting itself yes that's a very good question and that brings us to a very key point in evolution often when we read evolution and when in schools this topic is taught it is almost like a fiction it is like a story that you can take something from here and keep it there and it will adapt when i say adaptation what iram is trying to point towards is a very important and critical fact that it does not happen in one generation it's not like i take polar bear from the poles bring it forget about desert i bring it to a country which is temperate uh, sorry a uh, tropical you know it's not a proper desert but it's like the temperature is uh, 30 35 will the polar bear adapt no the polar bear will die right it will not adapt within one gen so adaptation does not mean that i can make changes in my own body to be able to so camels if they come from the desert to the polar areas they will not develop for all of a sudden and they will their rbc shape will shape will not change within their life span they will all die adaptation only makes sense when the change is so slow and so gradual that it gives the organism a time period across generations to change because what will happen let's say if sahara desert which at one point of time was the bottom of the sea now it is a desert it's a land when it was the bottom of the sea there were different organisms there all of them perished when it became desert and different kind of organisms evolved now let's say sahara desert changes hypothetically into a polar region okay something like that because of climate change but if that change is very fast if it's happening very fast like why we are all concerned about climate change climate has been changing on the planet since the very beginning of the planet why are we worried we are worried because it's happening faster than its natural pace because of human induced activities that's the problem we will not get time to adapt we means any life and and life will die will perish okay if camels are given time of millions of years and very slow gradual changes then one camel will produce 10 progenies let's say in its lifetime 
and the temperature during that one generation drops to 0.5 degrees and uh, then out of 10 progenies two could survive or do very well even if the temperature is a little lower other eight will just produce one or two progenies and die the two will live a longer life and produce eight or nine more progenies and then another 0.5 degree of dip and from that eight again two or three will do better and others will die and this is how in 10 20 30 generations you will see a camel which is very different from the ancestral population from which it all started the change started do you understand that Iram? does it make sense to you uh yes sir. so this is how uh, adaptation yeah yeah so this is how adaptation works it's not like if i take an organism out of its habitat and put it to some other habitat it will adapt it will not it might survive if the if the range in which the organism can survive is broader for example we all know that we have we have cheetahs being introduced in india from africa right you, have, you must have heard of that thing. Yes. Sir. There have been cheetahs introduced. At one point of time in India, there were cheetahs. But cheetahs were extinct because of you know extensive hunting. And then humans started shortening the forest covers. And cheetahs don't do very good when they share the territory with other high, you know, other uh, big cats like um, um, lions and tigers, which are more ferocious than cheetah. Cheetahs, to be very honest, are like cats of the big cats. You know, you, how many of you know that cheetahs can't even can't even um, like roar? They can't give a roar like tigers and lions. They meow, like they, their voice is more like a cat. So cheetahs and cheetahs can be tamed. They can be domesticated. You know, around humans they can live very well without attacking humans, but they will still hunt for other deers and things. But like lions and tigers are very different. They are very, very volatile and aggressive. So cheetahs used to live. Then they got extinct. There was a 70 years of gap. Then we reintroduced from some other region. Now, because in Africa and India, some parts of India are also very, very temporal parts are also like moderately hot. So from Africa, when they came to India, some of them may, will just live. But we will only get to know in the next generation and the generation after that, whether they have adapted to this climate or not, right? They're just living because there's not too much of a difference. If the difference was between Africa and Europe, if you bring cheetahs to Europe, for sure they're going to die. They're not going to change and be as good as the snow leopards, right? Okay, or the Siberian tigers. Yes, Iram, does that answer your question? So, of course, the organism will die. It will be vulnerable. Yes. So, one more thing. Um, so, in Darwin uh, finches, we mm -hmm. saw uh, there is only a certain amount of change. That is the change in their beaks. Whereas, right. in comparison to marsupial radiation, the mm -hmm. organism is completely, we see all the organisms, they are completely different uh, to each right. other. So, what right. makes it? this happened because in the first case in Darwin finches there's no you know a huge change but that's in perfect. this there right. is a huge change. that's a yeah that's a very very good question and uh, again you know some nitty gritty is that uh, it's very good that you're asking these kind of questions and you should ask these questions because someone just shows you a diagram and you're like okay let's believe it because you know we'll get marks doesn't make sense so you're very right. The adaptive radiation that we are talking about in both these cases are slightly different. In one case, Darwin, adaptive radiation simply means organisms had a common point from where they, like that common point is location-wise common point, not common for their ancestors. That is one thing that is um, below the sheets in adaptive radiation. So for Darwin's finches, that is the best example, one of a kind of example that Darwin said that, see, all these finches come from one particular population of finches that were seed eaters and used to live on island A. Then from island A, when they went to B, C, D, and E, F, all they needed to survive was to change their beak shape and their size, depending on how much nutrition they are getting. And that is good enough. 
so if by changing two three things you are good enough you will not change a lot like a bird will will not like to become something entirely different and it will not become something entirely different without any need right so the need there got fulfilled by just changes subtle changes in beak and size yeah so that's that's still adaptive radiation because the they radiated out to different geographical locations and they adapted uh, accordingly in case of marsupial mammals again the adaptive radiation means that they 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 radiated from a common origin in terms of geographical location all these organisms used to live in a common tropical region right so they they are all very different organisms one is a wolf another is a cat another is a kangaroo one is a bombat rat anteater mole squirrels and bear it's not like all of them came from one and uh, one organism and that we are calling as adaptive radiation no they all came from some similar habitat where all of them were still what they are but when they adapted to something like australia all of them then they showed changes accordingly just like the finches and one of the change that they all showed in their physiology and anatomy was that from placental mammals they became marsupial mammals does that make sense irum yes sir because that was important to adapt and some of them are also very closely related also like the like the tasmanian wolf uh, is very very closely related to uh, the, the, how many of you have heard of tasmanian devil there's a term called tasmanian devil in organisms anyone of know about it have you heard of it it's an extinct please repeat tasmanian devil the tasmanian tiger have you heard of it it's an extinct organism now it was scientific name was thylacine so the tasmanian tiger which you sorry the tasmanian wolf that you see in your ncrts is actually a um, it is a carnivorous marsupial which is which was also known as tasmanian tiger and it is extinct so so we yes tell me so tasmanian devil i'm just looking i'm just watching this in the google it's it kind of resembles to marsupial mole more of a marsupial mole than tasmanian wolf oh right right sorry sorry tasmanian tiger i meant not tasmanian devil yeah tasmanian devil is a uh, yes it is a dasyurida yes yes right right tasmanian tiger i meant okay tasmanian devil will look like tasmanian mole right it is you're correct thank you for correcting it but tasmanian tiger so tasmanian wolf is actually tasmanian tiger and we know that wolf what is the common thing between wolves and tigers is there anything common between what is a wolf are wolves uh, um connected to dog family or cat family how many of you have seen um what is the closest thing that looks like a wolf around like or things that you have seen i'm sure that i'm not sure if you have seen a wolf in your life or not i have not seen a wolf in my life only pictures so more of a dog exactly because the very because close thing to yeah. wolf is german wolf is what german shepherd right so wolf actually is a is a canid okay it's a uh it's a canis lupus it's a canidae and tiger when we say tiger we are talking about cats right they are felines so felid felines and canines are two different um categories of animals but when they saw tasmanian tiger they call it tasmanian um tiger in the first place but then they realized that tasmanian tiger is actually it's not whether it's a cat or a dog you can't so because its other name is tasmanian wolf so one name says that it's like a wolf another name which is like a dog the other name says it's like a cat which is like a tiger 
right? So that, that's the thing about thylacine. Recently, again, thylacines, thylacine came into a lot of limelight because for the first time, scientists have ex extracted RNA out of thylacines bones, like fossil. So these organisms, many of these that you see, which were result of adaptive radiation in Australia, the marsupial radiation are not no longer present, right? But we know that this radiation, this adaptation happened because of geographical location. So koala can't live in, because they are beer, they have to climb or be in like trees. So they cannot live in coastal or desert arid regions where there are no trees. Ant eaters cannot live in, uh, again, cannot live in coastal areas because there won't be ants near the water. So they will only live where the ants are present, like a, like a forest. Similarly, kangaroos will not live in a forest where you will find a lot of ant eaters and koalas, but they will live in little arid regions where they can easily jump because their movement is they jump using their hind limbs. So they need grassland kind of regions which are not obstructed by trees. Otherwise, it will be difficult for them to move around. Sugar glider, which is a flying phalanger, again, it won't live in that part of Australia where it, there will be no trees because it glides from one tree to another. It can't live on coastal areas or where the kangaroos can live, but it can live where the koalas can live, right? So they are going to different geographical locations, but since they are all marsupials, they will adapt differently. But what will be the common thing is that they are marsupials. They are not placental, they are marsupial. They will have their babies born without complete development. And most of them will have pouches, intact pouches. Does that make sense? You know, it's a good question. Does that, can, yes. Could I answer your question? Yes. Yeah. And if more than one adaptive radiation happens in, in an isolated geographical area, then it we can call it a convergent evolution. So multiple convergent evolutions also happen. So you can write down. Um, <clears throat> Mo uh, when more than one adaptive radiation occurs, when more than one adaptive radiation occurs, in a in an isolated geographical area in an isolated geographical area having different habitats having so that geographical area which is isolated should have different habitats having different habitats then it leads to convergent evolution okay make sense and the best example for this is all the marsupial mammals that evolved due to adaptive radiation in Australia also have their placental counterparts in other parts of the world. So if you have a marsupial mole, you also have a common mole. Now they are both moles, but they show convergent evolution. Um, so all the marsupials show convergent evolution at, at one point, but a, a placental mammals are very different. If you compare a mole with a mouse, with an anteater, and with a with a wolf, they're all very different. But all of them um, in Australia, because of convergent evolution, are very, very similar in some aspect. So I think NCRT also has shown a picture, if I remember correctly, comparing a wolf with a Tasmanian wolf. So we, we no longer 
prefer we, we do write it but we no longer prefer it as tasmanian tiger why it was you know why it was misnamed as tiger you can i think you can get an idea if you look at the picture in your ncert can you guess when you saw tasmanian wolf why the some people traps on the body the yes. straps yeah uh, it has like stripes time. yeah and only in half of the body so the smanian wolf has the stripes like a tiger in in the in the uh, like lower half of the body. i should not say lower but the dorsal half of the body and which gives it an appearance of like a tiger but it's a wolf it's more related closely related to dogs the canids than to felines okay perfect now uh, so if everything is clear till here i'll i'll move forward to the mechanisms of biological evolution every anyone has any questions i'll i can stop here for 2 minutes for questions if you have any no okay so let's go to now we, we have enough evidences to believe in evolution its processes different kinds of evolutionary processes hap which happens in different places etc etc now if we are convinced about evolution then let's dig a deeper in biological evolution and its mechanism when i talk about biological evolution i'm talking about majorly about evolution by natural selection okay so a common thing is evolution by natural selection now iram raised a point of changing the habitat drastically of an organism like just shifting it okay that's called habitat shift will that ever uh, help an organism to evolve it may if the new habitat is not that extreme that it kills the organism so it might you know evolve over time to fit better but if it's something very different then it will not evolve within one uh, life and it will die because for evolution to work through natural selection one thing which is very important is reproduction to happen and that also sexual reproduction to happen because only when sexual reproduction happens variations are formed and some of those variations might be useful <clears throat> to adapt in that environment and that they will get selected by nature make sense everyone the story cut short yes now based on reproduction if evolution is driven based on reproduction if i ask you a question do you think that the rate of evolution for different organisms will be different Yes or no? Yes, no. Do you think that rate of evolution will depend on reproduction? Of course. And if it depends on reproduction, sexual reproduction, then organisms that will reproduce faster and produce lots and lots of progenies don't you think that they can evolve faster than organisms who can evolve who can reproduce slower and uh, also produce less progenies yes or no does it make sense people so if i if i take an example of a unicellular yes parker tell me okay so if if i take an example of a bacteria okay let's say a bacteria compared to something very huge uh, like an elephant so we know that bacteria can can reproduce uh, every every uh, half an hour let's say and even if it's just by fission it's sexual reproduction it's asexual reproduction uh, do you think that if i if 
the environment of a bacteria changes at the same rate as compared to the environment of, a, of an elephant, bacteria can evolve faster in their, in their environment because within few hours, a colony of bacteria will, will create more and more variations as compared to an elephant, which gives birth so to another project. Tracking. Okay, just one second. Uh, is it is it better now? Yes. Yeah, okay. So my question was, if we try to understand Darwinian theory of evolution through natural selection, then the rate at which new variations and new life forms appear, it is linked to their own life cycle, right? Or the lifespan. Makes sense? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. So an organism which has a shorter life cycle, which will reproduce faster and produce more and more progenies in a small amount of time, will have an upper hand in making variations even in a changing environment and adapting to those variations faster. So organisms like elephants and humans, let's say, who have very long reproductive periods. So elephants almost give birth uh, to a baby almost around after two years of pregnancy, 22 months to be exact. So for 22, it takes 22 months for a female elephant to make a, one more elephant. And they often give birth to only one elephant, a huge one, because elephants are huge organisms. They won't give birth to six, seven, eight elephant babies like a dog or a cat, female dog or a female cat give birth to pup, litters of pups and kittens. And if we go even further down to simpler organisms, which are like insects, and then even further down, which are bacteria, then there within hours, you will find a lots of progenies, correct? A drosophila, which is a fruit fly, can lay up to uh, one female can lay up to, you know, hundreds of eggs in, in a day. So the rate of appearance of variation and new life forms is linked to the life cycle or the lifespan. Make sense, everyone? You can write yes. down, write down this thing. The rate of the rate of new life forms evolving is linked to is linked to the life cycle or the lifespan of the organism. The best evidence for this, we don't have to go back in time or study any fossils or anything. In just last four years, three years, I think, 2019, 2020 to 2023, we have seen so many different variants of COVID virus evolving, haven't we? Right? It yes. all started with one variant. Then it often, it, we, we came to a point where almost every month it was reported that a new variant is found in UK, another new variant is found in Europe, a new variant is found here and there, right? So viruses being so fast in their replication when they are within the host, they just have to hijack the machinery and just make copies of them. Millions and millions of copies within hours they can do. Of course, their rate of evolution will be faster. But here is a catch. They are not doing sexual reproduction, are they? They're just copying. It's like photocopying. One virus is just photocopying the another. And from one template, you can photocopy thousands and millions. But still they are evolving. How? 
Anyone can answer that? You know the answers, people. Bacteria, viruses, they don't do sexual reproduction. They don't find a mate, use them. So the part wasn't clear. Could you repeat? Yeah. So the question is, we saw viruses evolving. We saw the COVID virus evolving in these last three years to make multiple different new strains, right? Some strains are more lethal than the other. Some are more transmissible, more infectious than the other, et cetera, et cetera. But the question is, if you think variations can only come from sexual reproduction, then these organisms, the bacteria and the virus, are not doing sexual reproduction. They are just simply photocopying from a template, making millions of copies just from a template. It's just asexual. So how are they getting all the variation and they are evolving? The same can be asked for a bacteria. 70 years ago, we could kill almost all bacteria with penicillin. Now we can't. They are resistant to antibiotics. How is it happening if they are not reproducing through sexual reproduction? What do you think, people? Was that clear, the question, Iram and Parker? Yes, sorry. Yes, sir. Yeah, think about it. Doesn't it tell you that something is missing? It is, see, let's see what rules can be broken and what can't be. Uh, do you think that viruses can do sexual reproduction? Like we don't know, but they are doing sexual reproduction. No, right? Because viruses, the way they replicate, they are, they are almost non-living. They're like non-living outside the host. Inside the host, they just replicate through using host's machinery to replicate their own genome, DNA or RNA. That's it. And they make the protein using the host machinery. They assemble it. That's it. So it's like a car factory making parts and assembling back to make a car. That's not sexual reproduction. So clearly, sexual reproduction is not the only method through which variations can come up. Yes or no? This is the only possibility. Because organisms that do not reproduce through sexual reproduction, but can reproduce very fast, also evolve very fast and change very fast. Does that make sense, Hiram Parker? Yes. So if sexual reproduction is not the only way to, to make variations, what is the other way? How can an organism produce variations if not through sexual reproduction? We have talked about it a lot. It is a common thing that happens in biology. We studied about it in chapter five, chapter six. What is the one thing that can happen when you are copying something? Whether you are copying during sexual reproduction or you are copying during asexual reproduction. You are copying, right? That is true. Even if it is asexual, you're just copying. Asexual simply means photocopying. Sexual means before you are copying, you are putting some things in it different. You know, you are re... So sexual reproduction is like, like you know, uh, translating by giving your own inputs of a book. And so, yeah. So yes, maybe yes, different yes. mediums can be. Mediums. Uh, yeah. What do you mean by mediums? Uh, so like uh, we've seen in a um, molecular basis, the Griffith experiment, we have given the bacteria different mediums to survive. One it wasn't able to survive in one medium, whereas it could in the different, in, in the other medium. Uh, yeah, in Griffith's experiment, it was it was not the medium, but it was the strain of the bacteria itself. It was about transforming principle where there was a R strain and there was a S strain. R strain is not virulent, S strain is virulent, and then something goes from the R into so if something goes from the S into R that makes R also virulent. So that's about the I genetic see. material. Yeah. So sorry. Not the Griffith experiment. I think some experiment. 
Okay. I think you're, you're talking about uh, the Macri, uh, Martha, sorry, uh, Evliard Macri experiment where they basically took forward Griffith's experiment. Oh, Every yes. MacLeod and McCarty's experiment, but that was again not about um, the medium. It was about the molecules, the extract from the cell itself. That which is the that was the hunt for genetic material. But this is a very qu simple question. I just asked it in a in a convoluted manner. Parker says mistakes, and that is the right answer. Parker, can you give me a logical term for a more biological term for it? What do we call mistakes that happen? during copying of genetic material. Come on, come on. I was copying a genetic material. I was just reading A, T, G, C, G, A, T, T, C, C. By mistake, at one place, there was A. So I should have put a T, but I put a C. What is this called? That's called a mutation. Right? Make sense, people? Mutations yes. are another way by which variations can come up in a genome, even if it is not sexually reproducing. So viruses replicate so fast that they don't care sometimes about each and everything getting very, very like um, proofreaded and checked thoroughly. It does not matter if one base here or there gets, you know, re read and put wrong, it's okay. As far as you're able to assemble a new virus, it's fine. But that will help the virus to make variations. And when the immune system will try to fight one kind of variant out, the other kind of variant might survive better. And that helps. So mutations are another way to evolve in nature. And taking both these things into consideration, most of the lower organisms rely on mutations because they do not undergo sexual reproduction, but they reproduce really fast, super fast, as compared to higher organisms that undergo reproduction through sexual reproduction. And they mutate slower because, of course, they are reproducing slower. Okay. So just the example is that a colony of bacteria, let's say it grows on a given medium. Okay. Um, where you are giving it a variation of food to eat from. And uh, um, then you change the medium or you take that bacteria and put it on a medium where uh, they can only survive under one kind of a condition. So in some time, you will find that the population of the bacteria, some of them will get selected, other will grow, but some of them who are selected because of changes in their genome due to mutation, they will outgrow and over the time with accumulated changes, they can become new species. So this will happen within days for a bacteria, but it can take millions of years for a bird for that matter, because a bacteria and a bird are very different in their reproduction rates and also very different in their mutation rates and the rate at which their genome changes. So for virus, it can happen within a day. A new variant can come within a day. We will only get to know of it when the variant spreads. So every day during the COVID phase, there were variants made, but only those which were selected and were able to proliferate were being detected by us. Others will just die. Make sense? Yes, sir. Perfect. So uh, th this is how this is uh, the, the the evolution through Darwinian theory depends on the rate of reproduction, which is life cycle and life span also. Okay, so you just write down a running text that a, a, a colony of bacteria can evolve into different species, a colony of bacteria can evolve into different species under selection pressure. So we have, and of course we have to give some pressure, otherwise 
no organism would like to change okay it applies to humans also but more or less uh, to in general life also not in evolutionary context uh, only so given that your exams are near you will be compelled to study right so that's your selection pressure which is making you to study if there is no exam ever and you are just allowed to read in one standard for one year and the next standard for one other year most of us will learn nothing do you agree some of us yes. because we are inherently curious like you know the scientists of the earlier times were uh, will continue to learn more and more and more and more but if given the chance that okay no test no selection pressure just be at your space and learn we will not learn we will not change so that's why it's very important okay selection pressure works in biology it works in our day to day life and that's how our societies are also based on that's important okay so some sort of selection pressure is positive and being biology students understand that it's very important without a selection pressure no evolution happens so if you want to evolve into something beautiful and better than what you are now you have to go through pressures but take it in a positive spirit okay i'll do it it's not like if i cannot become a bird i can i'm just waste you know i can become something else so that also biology teaches you branching descent evolution is not just in one direction it's not like there is a race for the first position and the one who gets first position wins and the rest of all perishes no there is adaptive radiation there is convergent divergent all sorts of evolutionary mechanisms any one pick you can pick and you can evolve okay so always feel good about being living in the first place second thing being a human who can understand what's happening around you know if you were a, a cat or a dog or a deer you would not look up in the sky and think oh what are these revolving things you will just be worried about where is my food where should i go or oh, this is a predator or this is not a predator right those are also living systems but we are more fortunate to have evolved to, to have born as a human and be of the race perfect so having said that let's talk about these so we'll talk about natural selection which depends on rate of life cycle and mutations second is branching descent branching descent says that evolution is not in a line so many of you must have seen a picture which is a misrepresentation of human evolution where there is a there is a, a kind of a organism with a bent body then it tries to become erect and is erect and then becomes a human right yes sir they say and they say evolution of man or human something like that so here will be a, a ape or a monkey and here will be a human right so this gives a miss conception to students who study evolution that oh humans evolved from monkeys that's not true and that's not entirely true again the same logic if humans evolved from monkeys they shouldn't have been monkeys by now all monkeys should have been humans but monkeys and humans and gorilla chimpanzee they are all um when we when we say we are primates so there are higher primates which are chimpanzees and humans and gorillas baboon orangutans with some baseline cognitive ability which is higher than other mammals and non primates like cows dogs cats etc so and one of the characteristic feature of primates is that the ability to either partially or fully stand on the the hind limbs or the hind foot the appendages which are at the back we call it foot so if it's not just humans can stand on the humans can do it very well humans are bipedal but given uh, the conditions you might also have seen videos where 
monkeys if they are holding few things in their hand they can actually walk on their two last feet as well right chimpanzees do this very often so in zoos there are multiple videos where chimpanzees when they are running if it's raining the way we react to rains they also react to rains they find a shelter or some of them you know just uh, sit in the rain and enjoy the rain and when they find the shelter they try to cover their heads with something they are holding in their hand and they if they are eating a food they will pick the food with the other hand and they will start running on two foots to find a shelter so bipedality also evolved uh, and i think this is what the picture wants to tell you that from from a curved spine we had a erect posture and that is what the picture wants to say but instead it 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 says uh, in a misinformed way that humans evolved from monkeys which is not correct so we'll come to human evolution at the end but by branching descent what what darwin meant was that evolution does not work in in a in a linear fashion one after the other there are always from one focal point more than two branches it can happen that the one branch goes a little forward and then cease to exist because of extinction those organisms could not adapt but the other branch successfully form two more branches and then two more and then one cease here dies here one dies and something continues right so it's always like a branching descent so this was organism 1 that evolved into the latest like which is here right but with this there will be multiple others which are also surviving who came from the same branch so that is the thing about humans in human homo sapiens sapien is the only species that is surviving at the planet now but sapiens were not the only humans that evolved there were many other human species that evolved and were on the planet back in the days um like homo neanderthals homo habilis homo erectus homo um devsonian etc etc okay homo sapiens out competed and also kind of defeated all of them in long wars which made them extinct and we could survive so we'll talk about it later but branching descent is clear everyone natural selection and branching descent are, are these both both these concepts clear okay perfect now before darwin i want you i'm giving you some homework today you have to go and read about lamarck it's called lamarckism the theory of which was given by so no it was not just darwin who was a thinker at that time who was trying to find out answers there was another naturalist who was from france in europe so darwin was in england he was in france and he was also a naturalist and he was before darwin who thought about evolution of life forms and he came to a conclusion based on his observations that it is the use and use of organs or abilities that but he gave also examples so he took giraffes as an example in lamarckism and he said that and it was so his start point and end point was correct what was the fault was his assumption for the process so we know that the ancestors of giraffe were not long necked they had very stunted neck in fact the ancestors of camels and giraffe both were like goats only like if you see a progression if you see a buffalo buffalo does not have a cows they don't have very long necks but when you go to goats so goats have slightly longer neck as compared to their body uh, and if you compare them with sheep which are very close to them again sheep don't have long necks then you go to uh, organisms like you know llama alpaca they have longer necks then then it's giraffe it has a very long neck so the ancestors didn't have long neck 
fossil records show that but current organisms have it so lamarck thought that the way giraffe eat giraffe always likes to eat leaves from the trees like they uh, but their ancestors who had who had shorter neck if you'll see organisms with short neck what do they eat what do cows and buffaloes eat grass sorry grass from the ground right but to reach the ground also you need to have a neck of the length that can reach the ground correct make sense yes if you don't have a longer neck how many of you have seen uh the baby goat eating something you will often see that what they do is they sit on their front legs right they kind of sit on their front legs and then they reach the grass down and eat it right but if you want to eat leaves from the tree either one one thing that you can do is try to stand up on your front legs which is not a very good uh, thing or stable thing to do you are more prone to predation and falling and risking your self to injuries so what lamarck thought is that giraffes try to stretch their neck by their will you know in every generation every generation wanted to eat from the trees so there was scarcity of food on the ground and that was the selection pressure so he also talked about similar things that darwin talked and he was uh, he was taking right kind of inputs but the output was based on use and disuse of organs so giraffes use their necks to stretch their necks to get food so that constant use of the neck to get food that constant stretching generation after generation led to giraffes developing longer necks by every generation is it is true that by every generation giraffe had slightly longer neck but the reason was not use or disuse the reason was simply genetic variation and since lamarck didn't know about that that if a giraffe give rise to 10 progenies let's say a primitive prehistoric ancestor of giraffe give rise to 10 progenies and all of them are reaching out for food just because of natural variation like in humans humans you will see five siblings in the same family all five of them will not have the same height correct as their parents make sense yes sir that simple natural variation because of sexual reproduction and one will be taller than the other similarly in giraffe just by natural variations there were giraffe with slightly longer necks and the others with slightly shorter now because the food scarcity was there which is right the giraffe with slightly longer neck will have a slightly higher edge of getting food better and then it will get selected so lamarck's theory was um not uh, approved scientifically for the for the process that he gave that it is the uh, that evolution of life forms is driven by use and disuse of organs uh, so that is called doctrine of desire so lamarckism is based on doctrine of desire so if you can become what you desire very very you know motivating but not biologically completely correct so if a if a there are fish like mud skippers we talked about in, in the last class that come out of the ground and walk on the ground they are fish basically right and there are also uh, fish that fly they just glide out of the water and fly for a distance and then go back down in so both of them have adaptations in one case you will see that the fin are more like uh, appendages in the other case the fins are more like wings but that didn't happen because they wanted one fish wanted to conquer the land and the other fish wanted to fly in the air no that just happened because of pressures around them which allow which made them to either come out of water for food so flying fish come out of the water and fly for some distance so that they can travel farther and find food same happens with fish like mud skippers so these were the pressures and that pressure drove evolution but not because of desire okay so if a human wants to develop wings 
Howsoever I want, if I start an experiment now with one human couple wanting wings, they will keep wanting wings for 100 generations. It's not like you will get wings. It's not desire. It's the selection pressure of the nature. Make sense, everyone? Bats could get wings because of that. They are also mammals. Okay. So he said, giving example of giraffe, that they, they, they in attempt to forage leaves from tall trees, giraffe had to adapt by elongating their necks. And as they, can, they could pass on this acquired character. So when one giraffe stretched its neck, it passed it on to other. And succeedingly, giraffe were um, longer necked. But he was, but he was, uh, why he reached this conclusion was he saw in society that we can change our body and our form by our will to some extent. For example, if a person wants to become a bodybuilder, all that person has to do is to be on a high protein diet and train himself or herself harder. And you can develop muscles and strength that an average human will not have. If an average human wants to become a gymnast, then he will he cannot bulk up the body. He or she cannot bulk up the body because a bulky body cannot do gymnastics. So that person will practice more and more flexibility and agility and can will be able to bend its body almost like in a circle. So you might have seen gymnasts who can turn their whole body in a circle. You might also have seen bodybuilders whose body is like a rock. Make sense? Now, both are humans. But because they desired to do something with their bodies, they could change their form to these two extremes. Make sense, everyone? Yes. But Lamarck, so, um, Lamarck thought, and he was correct in thinking that, that, okay, if humans can do that, why can't giraffes and animals? Which is still acceptable. Okay, let's say they did it. But a bodybuilder cannot pass on that character or that trait to its progeny. So it's not like once I have built a body, a muscle, I have become the rock, I can pass it on and my next generation without doing anything will be rock to begin with. They will again be born with the baseline thing. They will have both ways either to become a gymnast or to become a bodybuilder again. So we cannot pass certain characteristics which are called acquired traits through our uh, reproduction, re reproductive pathways, like our uh, gametes, like intelligence cannot be passed on. Uh, like if I am learned in one kind of skill, my progenies will be born with that skill is not true, right? Same is with the form and shape of agility, flexibility, strength of the body. So it's not like a, a doctors, we often have these myths a ruler's son will be a ruler, a peasant's son will be a peasant. These were the myths with which society used to operate in the past. With science coming in, we have to break these. We have to understand what is more bio, what is more logically correct. These traits cannot be passed on. And therefore, there should not be pressures. So there's always a pressure, a said or unsaid pressure, if someone's parents are scientists. And if the kid wants to become a painter or a singer, and doesn't want to do something in academia, it, it, it will be thought of like, oh, your parents are so brilliant surgeons, doctors, engineers, and you want to become a singer, you want to become an actor, you want to do a job in this sector, what is this, right? So that whole assumption is baseless because it's not like if parents are something, you will, you will be something. Of course, you, if you also have that, have that uh, enthusiasm and passion for the field, you can learn, but you have to do your learning right from the beginning like your parents did. Does it make sense, everyone? So nowadays, we know that this conjecture of uh, Lamarckism is not true, and hence it is uh, rejected as the major driving theory of evolution. But let me tell you just a simple thing that now, there are now scientists are redefining Lamarckism as neo Lamarckism, where what Lamarck said it doesn't make it doesn't hold true at a at an organismal level, like at the level of the macro structure of organism. But now there are evidences that some things that we used to think are acquired traits can actually be passed on, but not through the genome, but apart from the genome 
and this whole field is called epigenetics. Epi means above, like epidermis. Genetics is genetics, genome. So it's not like you everything you pass on to your progeny is you pass only through the genome. You can also pass things through other ways which are not genomes, but those things are limited. That cannot be the capability to paint like Picasso. Like Picasso could not pass it on to their progenies to become like Picasso and so on. But some things like more behavioral and physiological, for example, vulnerability to stress and depression, vulnerability to certain kind of diseases can be passed on without changing the genome. And that whole field is called epigenetics. If any one of you is interested, just go and try to take a look what is epigenetics. And epigenetics, people believe, is the neo-Lamarckism on a molecular level um, as a theory. And we have evidences. We are now having, getting evidences in favor of that. Okay, so uh, uh, is Lamarckism clear? Darwinism, uh, the Darwinian theory of natural selection, branching descent and Lamarckism. Both, all these things are clear to you? Yes? Yes. No? Okay, perfect. So we are out of time. So let's stop here. And as we had one class in reserve, so I, we, we might have to use that. I was planning to finish it this Wednesday, but then now this chapter will be finished next Monday. So two more classes and this chapter is done. So in the next class, I will talk about saltations, uh, mutations, saltations, founder effect, and Hardy-Winberg principle. And then in the final class, we will talk about overall evolution of plant animals, including humans, okay? And then it will be done. So please bring your questions. If you have any questions, keep revising because there are a lot of concepts in this chapter. This chapter is all about concepts. So if you don't understand the concept, you will be left with remembering the definitions or mugging up the definitions, which becomes very boring then, okay? Okay, see you. See you in the next class. So, yes, Iram, so, you have questions? Yes, yes. Uh, so um, okay. actually I have a upcoming test for biotechnology. So do you have any uh, recorded lectures of your? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I, I think I have for biotechnology, right? Uh, do one thing, just yes. write on the WhatsApp group that you need uh, recorded lectures for biotechnology and we'll send you YouTube links for those lectures there. Okay? Okay. okay. You are on the WhatsApp group, right? Yes. So either me or someone from the uh, team will uh, reach back to you with the links for the lectures. Yeah? Yes, sir. Okay. And when is your test? If you still have doubts and uh, or... Uh, if you have read the chapter yourself and you have doubt in the next class, um, you can join 15 minutes before with me and we can go over your doubts. Anything that okay. helps you. Okay. okay. I'll let you. But, but yeah, but do let me know in advance, uh, not, not 15 minutes in advance, like in much in advance, uh, either before Wednesday on the WhatsApp group. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. okay perfect.